Hi, I'm Tatiana Falcon, a child psychiatrist here at Cleveland Clinic Epilepsy Center. Welcome to a series of webinars targeting educational topics for parents of children with epilepsy. We assemble a great team of doctors, psychologists, nurses, social workers, parents, patients with epilepsy and epilepsy educators to help you navigate all the different challenges that epilepsy may present. Project Care for Epilepsy is designed to improve care coordination, increase social support, provide education, and increase engagement for teens with epilepsy and their families. This project is supported by the Health Resources Services Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The information, content, and conclusions presented here are those of the authors and are not the official position or policy of HRSA, Health and Human Services, or the U.S. government. At the end of each webinar, there will be a link to answer four questions about the new topic you just learned about. Please take a moment to answer this quick survey. It will help us understand your needs better. The Cleveland Clinic Epilepsy Center welcomes and thank you for your participation in this educational series. Hello, I am Dr. Pestana Knight. I am a pediatric epileptologist at the Cleveland Clinic Epilepsy Center. And today I am gonna be talking to you about diagnosing epilepsy. To start, I would like to tell you that epilepsy is a very old disease. It was first described in the ancient Babylonian times. This is over 3,000 years ago. The first description of epilepsy appeared in an old medical text, which name was the Sakiku. As you can see in the picture, this book was written in stone. This first description of epilepsy include the description of different epileptic seizures. Epilepsy is also a disease that is widespread in the world. It's estimated that around 50 million of people live with epilepsy in today's world. Around 3 million of these people live in the United States. A frequent question that we encounter in our practice is how we differentiate seizures from epilepsy. Well, first we need to address what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a disease of the brain. The main symptom of epilepsy is seizures. There are many seizure types, and we are gonna talk about a little bit later today. Epilepsy is characterized by recurring or repeating seizures. These seizures are caused by sudden changes in the electricity of the brain. Sometimes patients with seizures do not have epilepsy. This sounds confusing, but it's not. Why? Because a seizure is a symptom of different conditions that could affect the brain. A seizure is the way the brain reacts to different injuries or alterations to its metabolic environment or functional environment. For example, there are different situations that can lead to a seizure and they are not epilepsy. One common situation is febrile seizures or high fever. If a child experiences a high fever, this could lead to a seizure and this is not epilepsy. Some medications can cause seizures. Equally, a head trauma or concussion could also result in a seizure without this necessarily being epilepsy in the acute setting. Although if the injury is severe enough, could lead to epilepsy in the future. Fainting or syncope are also forms of seizures. 
a stroke or acute bleeding in the brain could lead to seizures. Asphyxia or lack of oxygen to the brain could also lead to seizures. Some medical conditions such as diabetes that could lead to low blood sugar or high blood sugar could lead to seizures. Heart disease causing hypertension or low blood pressure or hypotension could also lead to seizures. Some metabolic changes such as electrolyte imbalances, high sodium, low sodium, low magnesium, low calcium could also cause seizures. Let's talk about now what are the main epilepsy types. Epilepsy is to divide in two main categories, focal or partial epilepsy and generalized epilepsy. They are a group of patients who could have combination of both or multiple types of focal epilepsy. How doctors diagnose epilepsy? The main tools are the medical history and examination, and then they will resort to a number of tests, the most important being the electroencephalogram and the brain imaging. Among these, the most important is the brain MRI and the number of tests. Other tests will be done depending on uh, what is the hypothesis of the cause of the epilepsy. Your doctor will also order a number of blood tests to rule out other cause, the causes of epilepsy and to make sure that this is not just a seizure caused by something else. Within the blood test, the doctor will be looking for infections, high and low blood sugar, poison by heavy metals such as lead, evidence of anemia, liver disease, kidney dysfunction, metabolic problems, genetic problems. The doctor will also order neuropsychological tests looking for intellectual disability or behavioral problems, etc. What will the, your doctor ask you in the medical history? Well, the most important thing is what the seizures look like because there are many different types of seizures. The doctor will also find out if there are factors that could indicate the, the cause of the epilepsy. These factors could be any complication during the pregnancy or any complication during the delivery or in the uh, immediate postnatal period or any complication during the infancy such as infections or febrile illnesses, etc. The doctor will be very interested on how your child is doing at school is there is a history of other neurological problems such as difficulties developing or learning or walking. The family history of epilepsy is also very important. Let's talk about the different seizure types. In the case of partial seizures, sometimes the patients can experience an aura. An aura is a focal seizure that is experienced in a small part of the brain in charge of a sensory function. This is typically the earliest part of the seizure, and it may be the only part of the seizure that the patient remembers. Not all the patients who have epilepsy has auras. Not all the auras are followed by other clinical manifestations of the seizures. Typically, the auras cannot be observed by people standing by during the seizure. The aura is typically a sensation that is felt by the patient prior to the onset of the clinical manifestation of the seizure. The aura can present with symptoms such as nausea, blurred vision, feeling phony or weird, and some patients have truly difficulties describing their auras. 
Some examples of auras are tingling, or flashing lights, or visions, or hearing noises, or um, voices. Auras are not exclusive of epilepsy. Auras are also common seen in migraine headaches. I have some cartoons here to illustrate how some of the seizures in uh, children and patients can look like. A common type of seizure is characterized by staring and unresponsiveness. This is a representation of what it could be an absent seizure or a complex partial seizure. During some of the seizures, the patient can act or look confused, and what the patient is doing can seem out of context with the situation that is happening at the moment. This staring and unresponsiveness and confusion, they are typically short-lived and they last for one or two minutes only. After this time, the patient can resume their activity or experience a post period. We are gonna see in a few minutes what a post period is. Sometimes during the seizures, the children could look like they are wandering around aimlessly. Sometimes they have additional extra movements like hand picking or lick smacking. These symptoms are also known as oral or manual automatism. This oral and manual automatism can be associated to the staring, the confusion, or the wandering behavior. It's also common that children have jerking or twitching of one eye, one side of the face, the neck, the arm, one leg, of the whole side of the body. So sometimes the jerking or the twitching can be bilateral and involve both eyes, both sides of the face, both arms, or, or the whole body. This is what is also known as a grand mal seizure. Next to this cartoon, you can see a cartoon of the shaking and falling, like the one that is seen in the generalized tonic clonic seizure or grand mal seizure. These are the most common seizure types that we see in, pra in the practice, but there are others. So when in doubt, describe the symptom to your doctor. And in the era of technology, it's very important that you can use your cell phone or home device to make a small video and bring it to the office. So what is a postictal period? The postictal period is the time that follows a seizure. The patient can be tired or sleepy or complain of a headache or more rarely be unable to move a part of the body. It typically lasts five to 10 minutes, sometimes it's even longer. Some patients do not experience a postictal period. Let's talk now about what are the main tests to aid in the diagnosis of epilepsy. Epilepsy is, an, is diagnosed using the clinical symptoms and the EEG. This conform the electroclinical syndrome. The main test that the doctor resort to for the diagnosis is the electroencephalogram. During this test, an electroencephalogram tech will attach electrodes to the scalp of the patient to read the brain wave activity. This test does not hurt. This test does not give electricity to the, to the brain of the patient. This is not the same as electroconvulsive therapy. 
And the EEG can be done with some variations. It can be done in the hospital and recorded for 20 minutes, known as routine EEG. It can be done for two hours or eight hours. Or it can be done over nine and known as video EEG. It also can be done in the ambulatory setting, meaning that your child or the patient will be sent home with the uh, device recording the EEG while the patient is at home performing the regular activities. This EEG is widely available and it also can be done inside the hospital and even when patients are very sick, like in the intensive care unit. This is why the recording of the EEG looks like, and the doctors are trained to read and interpret when the EEG is done, if the patient is awake, if the patient is asleep, if the patient is a young child, if the patient is having a seizure, or if the patient has activity that is indicative of epilepsy. Oftentimes, your doctor would request that you have a brain MRI. Most of the machines look like this. The MRI machine shows the structure of the brain. It is like a photograph of the brain. The person get, getting in the MRI is not getting radiation exposure like when it's getting a head CT of the brain. The brain MRI gives the doctors better details of the brain structure than a head CT. Doing a brain MRI doesn't hurt. This test takes 45 minutes to an hour to be done. The downside to do this test in young children is that you have to be still during the performance of this test. Therefore, in very young kids, it's necessary to uh, get anesthesia so they will be asleep during the test. Anesthesia or sedation. Also, people who have claustrophobia or, or are afraid of being in very enclosed areas will need some help to get this test done. This is what a brain MRI will look like. There are other tests that give additional information on uh, the function of the brain. There are tests that help to look at how particular of the areas of the brain function. These tests are not done in all the patients who have epilepsy. Uh, this is the case of the PET scan. The PET scan is done if uh, the hypothesis that this patient has focal epilepsy and there is an idea of performing epilepsy surgery. In this category of tests, there are other tests that like the functional MRI that are done to localize the onset, the ictal zone onset in relationship with functional areas such as the speech area, the motor areas, the visual motor cortex. There are other specific tests done for to localize the language. Uh, magnetoencephalogram, etc. But these tests are tailored to the need and the specific hypothesis for epilepsy surgery. We can spend days talking about this test. This is what the PET scan that I show you is another form of a scan will look like. And this PET scan is based on the um, theory of the head CT. So for this test, the patient will get radiation. There are other tests that are not done in the radiology lab. They are done in the office. And the neuropsychology and the psychiatric evaluation are also important part of the evaluation of the patient with epilepsy because more recently we have recognized that there are a number of neuropsychiatric comorbidities that come uh, along with epilepsy. So to really ensure that the patient have a good quality of life after you treat them with any of the modalities that we have to treat epilepsy today, we also need to address all these comorbidities. They are depression, anxiety, attention deficit disorder, and hyperactivity, 
autism and other socialization problems, opposition defying behavior, migraines, learning disabilities, developmental delay and intellectual disabilities. This test and this evaluation help us to identify and appropriately treat any of these problems that can be concurrent uh, with epilepsy. Last, I want to talk to you about what to do if somebody is having a convulsion. First, I, I want to tell you the things that you should do. The first things that you should do are, are things uh, directed toward saving and protecting the patient. The number one is position the patient on his or her side, and this is done to protect their weight. Always remember, remember the ABCs that you learn when you take the first aid course. The next thing is watch for breathing. The B is for breathing and is the B of the ABC. The next thing is time for seizures. Oh, we always hear the parents or the relatives saying the seizure seems that they last forever. It's true, but most of the seizures stop in their own after around one minute mark. But if the seizures last longer, we may need to administer something that we call rescue medications. And this is a medication that will help the patient to stop the seizures. Then you should move any dangerous objects from the range of the patient so the patient don't injure themselves during the seizure. You could sm place small folded blanket or a cushion around so the patient won't hit uh, himself if he or she is moving violent. Uh, or there is a risk for a head injury, you should call an ambulance if it is necessary or you are not sure what you should be doing. You shouldn't drive with a patient if the patient is having a seizure because it's very likely that you could get in an accident. If you are driving and your child is having a seizure, a safe thing to do is to pull aside and wait that the seizure stop or wait and then call the ambulance. If you are at home, always allow the child to sleep after the seizure. You should not lift or shake the patient. You should not restrain the, sh the patient. By restraining the patient, you could actually cause a shoulder dislocation or a bone fracture or a muscle laceration because you will restrain the free movement that is happening uh, involuntarily during the seizure. You shouldn't put anything in the mouth. It's not true that the patient will swallow the tongue during the seizure. This anatomically is not possible. And you should not drive with a patient who is having a seizure. You should pull aside. When you should call an ambulance? Well, if your child stops breathing and you are not uh, versed on first aid, is the skin looks blue in, and it doesn't return to normal after the seizure. You may first notice that the uh, skin turns blue around the mouth and the nail bed. Uh, if the seizure lasts more than five minutes, even if the color is good and the breathing is normal, if the seizure does not stop five minutes after you have given the rescue medication. I think that this covers the first aid for seizure and how we diagnose epilepsy. If you have any questions from our conversation today, please contact us at the Epilepsy Center of the Cleveland Clinic. Again, I am Dr. Pestana Nai. It has been a pleasure to be on this conversation with you today. Thank you very much.